Well, very good morning, brothers and sisters in the drama. My name is Dr. Wee, and I'm your moderator this morning. So I'd like to welcome all of you to Sunday at BGF. This is something that we have, inviting speakers to speak to us on a Sunday morning. Today, we have a very special speaker who will be speaking from India. In fact, he will be speaking at Dehradun on the foothills of the Himalayas. And uh, he will share with us teachings from a very special Zen master, Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, truly a living Buddhist master. Now, I will encourage you to click like and also to comment on the Facebook because this helps us in the Facebook algorithm. And certainly we can take some questions. At the end of the talk, we will leave about 20 minutes for question answers. And uh, for us to spot a question, uh, please put a Q, capital Q, and then you type your questions. And uh, we will be able to uh, transmit the questions over to the speaker. Now, before I introduce to you our speaker this morning, who will, speak, who will be speaking on the path of Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, I would like to give you some uh, background on this remarkable teacher who once came to Malaysia at our invitation uh, to the World Buddhist Conference. A venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, or Te, which is Vietnamese for teacher, he says that you don't have to die to experience the kingdom of heaven or pure land. You just need to live in the present moment to experience the kingdom of heaven or pure land. Be in the present moment where you will find peace. More than anyone in the West, Te has been speaking about mindfulness and living in the present moment even before these two concepts became fashionable in the West. His message is that there is no peace in reminiscing about the past or worrying about the future. Just be with your breath. It is only in the present moment that you will fully come alive. Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh is a global spiritual teacher. He's also a poet and a peace activist. He's revered around the world for his teachings on mindfulness, on global ethics and peace. And he has offered modern translations of key Buddhist texts and spoken on a wide range of global issues. Te was ordained as a monk at the age of 16 in Vietnam. Now he grew up as a young monk in the early 1950s and was engaged in the movement to renew Vietnamese Buddhism. And he soon envisioned a kind of engaged Buddhism that would respond directly to the needs of society. When Vietnam was caught in a war, the Vietnam War, the monks and nuns of Vietnam was confronted with the question, do they continue with their con contemplative life in monasteries and not be involved in the world? Or did, do they go out to help those in suffering under the bombings and turmoil of war? Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh chose to do both. He was in fact one of the six, first six monks to ride a bicycle in Saigon, and he founded the Engage Buddhism Movement. And they encourages his followers uh, to develop insight by looking deeply into an issue. Let me give you a story. The Vietnamese were suffering during the Vietnam War, where the Americans had a huge bombing campaign to stop North Vietnam from spreading communism to other parts of Indochina. In fact, the amount, amount of bombs that were dropped in Indochina was three times the amount of bombs dropped during the Second World War. So one of the young Vietnamese monks was in the street of Saigon, and he found that an American soldier standing on an army truck had spat on his head and he was laughing at him. As the young monk wiped the spittle from his head, he was filled with so much anger that he wanted to leave monkhood and join the Viet Cong to kill the Americans. When this young monk spoke to Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, Te told him that just as the Vietnamese are suffering, these American soldiers are suffering as well. Everyone suffers in the war. Some of the soldiers will be killed or maimed. It is not a war that the soldiers want to fight. They would rather go home to be with their family. Once the young man realized that both the Vietnamese and the Americans are both suffering, anger turns into compassion. 
he gave up the anger of leaving monkhood and became very energetic, cycling to villages to help up with the people whose lives had been devastated by war. Thay was a prominent teacher and social activist during the Vietnam War. He traveled to the United States and Europe to make a special case of peace and call for the end of hostilities in Vietnam. In 1966, he met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was so impressed by Thay that he called him an, an apostle of peace and nonviolence and nominated him for the Nobel Prize, Nobel, Nobel, Nobel Peace Prize in 1967. As a result of his mission, he was not able to return back to Vietnam. He was barred, both North and South Vietnam barred him from returning from the country. And he was exiled from Vietnam for four decades just for calling out for peace. Now, they established a palm village in southwest of France, and it has now become the West's largest and most active Buddhist monastery. It has about 200 resident monastics and over 10,000 visitors every year who has come from various parts of the world to learn about the art of mindful living. And Plum Village welcomes all ages, people of all ages, background, and even faith at the retreats where they can practice mindfulness, walking, sitting, eating, smiling, or even breathing. Hmm? So uh, Tay was a pioneer in bringing Buddhism and mindfulness to the West and created mindful communities around the world. And he has a tremendous impact on politicians, business style, uh, Venerable Thich Han published over 100 books, and 70 of that are written in English. He's truly an impressive uh, spiritual teacher. And our speaker this morning is closely associated with Thay, having received the ordination as Dhammacharya from the Master. Dhamma, you know, the truth. Charya comes from the word Acharya, so teacher of Dhamma. He was ordained under Venerable Thich Han. Shantam says, has been teaching Dharma in India, Asia, and across the world. He leads Buddhist pilgrimages, including the one that he organized for Te and the monastics from the Palm Village. Um, Shantam Ji is involved in social, environmental, and educational programs, including programs on cultivating mindfulness in society. I think he also has a book on teaching mindfulness meditation for kids, yeah, for children. He was a senior advisor to the World Bank and the Indian Ministry of Culture and Ministry of Tourism on Buddhism and in, on Buddhist uh, pilgrimage. And Sunday Ji will tell us on how he got associated with Tay and will share with us some of Tay's key teachings. And he has contributed to a number of books and also spoken on TED Acts and appears on a weekly program on Z TV in India where he offers teachings on Buddhism and meditation in everyday life. I would like to invite uh, Shantam Ji to speak to us this morning. Shantam. Thank you so much, Dr. Victor Wee, for uh, your wonderful introduction to Thai, my teacher, and uh, my introduction to me. And thank you so much for inviting me to share with your Sangha, the Buddhist Gem Fellowship. Um, I feel that uh, I've met you a number of times uh, at the International Buddhist Confederation, also on the pilgrimage path. And uh, I really appreciate what you've been trying to do uh, to not just bring the Dhamma back uh, to Malaysia in a sort of more contemporary way, but also building the Sangha. And I think that's really holy work. So thank you very much. And thank you to Bobby Young, who's been uh, one of the most efficient WhatsAppers I've met in my life, and to Alex for putting all this together, and the larger Sangha Buddhist Gem Fellowship. So I feel that it's a real honor to be sharing uh, what I feel I've learned uh, of the Dhamma being from India uh, with a, a culture which is Buddhist. Of course, in India, we have lost, uh, we had lost Buddhism probably around the 13th century. Uh, it had gone down anyway before that. And so for us in India, meeting other Buddhists who've been living this culture for, you know, for many centuries is also a great pleasure. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, uh, it's, it's a sort of sense of brotherhood and sisterhood that we have through the Buddhist world. And uh, I sometimes feel that this COVID time, it's a funny time, we're all sharing this, um, this sort of collective suffering of a sort. And how do we come out of it? I, I was reminded, I, I carry these two things all the time. My little, um, you know, hand sanitizer, my mask, and this is very much a, a sort of uh, a, 
a fashion of our times, if, if for want of a better word, and we are all doing this. And so what are we learning from this? This is the time to transform both individually and collectively. And because the Buddha's teachings are so much based on the transformation of suffering, this is a collective suffering we are feeling. And what do we come out of it? And I also feel that this is a time when we can really touch those core teachings of the Buddha of impermanence and non-self, the interconnectedness of everything. And I don't think humanity has ever had this opportunity like this before. So let us see if we can walk through this portal of the COVID into a new type of uh, collective awakening. And let's hope so. And one of the things I've learned from my own teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, is the use of the bell, the mindfulness bell. So I'm going to invite the bell. And uh, you can only see the edge of it. It's a large bell. Uh, I have a little mini bell, but it's, uh, I'll, I'll invite the larger bell. The sound is slightly more resonous. And um, just listen to the sound. Let the sound penetrate into your sound consciousness, into your consciousness. And let go of all your thinking. Let go of all your worries, all your anxieties. Just come back to the present with the sound. And then I will just uh, guide you a little bit into the breath. As you let the sound calm your mind. Now the third sound, come back to your breath. Just a natural breath, breathing in and breathing out. Being aware of the in-breath as you breathe in. And being aware of the out-breath as you breathe out. In. Out. Wonderful. And this practice of coming back to your breath allows you to come back into the present moment, very much like Dr. Wee was talking about, how to bring us back to the present, to touch this moment, and to touch the miracle of life. We are alive right here, right now, wherever we are in the world. Most of us are in Malaysia, and I feel that there's a great uh, similarity of this aspiration of practice, of bringing mindfulness, of bringing joy, of bringing peace into our lives. And I've learned this very much from my own teacher, the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, and that's why we call this topic, we call it cultivating mindfulness, peace, and joy in the footsteps of Thich Nhat Hanh. And you know, I just feel maybe it's good to share a little of my own story that as a uh, as a way of how I met Thai, uh, we call Thich Nhat Hanh Thai, Thai means teacher in Vietnamese. Um, I left India when I was about 18 to go and study and work in England. And uh, I managed to land uh, my dream job when I was about 22 uh, in the corporate sector, earning more than my parents, uh, working for a multinational. And then I remember it was, I think, the 4th of May, 1979, the day that Margaret Thatcher came to power in England for the first time. I crashed a beautiful red MGB sports car, totaled it. I woke up in hospital the next day and I just wondered what have I done for anybody else? I've, I'm young, I had ideals, but I really had not done much for others. I was just earning a lot of money for myself. 
And I had faced suffering. Um, I had been in England uh, a few years by then. I'd been beaten up three times for my color. Um, once as, you know, I, I too was spat in my face by somebody right in the middle of, this, uh, of the uh, city of Leicester. Um, and it brought up a lot of uh, suffering and anger in me. I went to the police, I remember, to complain. And they said, oh, we can't do anything about it. It's, it's, they sort of made me feel it was my fault for being brown or black. Um, it's a bit like telling a woman you, you've been raped because you're a woman. It's, it, it's that sort of, but, and then I remember also when I worked for Clark's, a shoe company, I used to go to India to buy shoes for them. And when I was there, I, uh, my hotel bill for one night was more than what a shoe worker with a great degree of skill, the skill of an eye doctor, would earn in a whole week. So I moved out of my hotel and started living with the uh, Jatavs in, in their slum. The Jatavs are a particular community of leather workers uh, who uh, are considered untouchables. And I remember staying in that temple, which is a very small room. And in it, there was a big, sta big uh, poster of the Buddha and also of Ambedkar. Uh, Ambedkar was a great uh, 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 lawyer and also the architect of India's constitution. And he had embraced Buddhism six weeks before he died in 1956. And so many of the so-called untouchables had embraced Buddhism with him because he was also from the so-called untouchable community. So this is my first contact with Buddhism, actually. And, but uh, it was more from a social and, uh, point of view. And so when I came back to England, um, I talked to my managing director, Mr. Clark, and I, uh, I left. I left the, this dream job of mine, much against my parents' wishes at the time. Um, and I felt I really want to change the world and change it fast, like many young people do. And I was inspired by Gandhi uh, in his nonviolent direct action, and also the revolutionary in me, the, inspired by Che Guevara and others. So this sort of uh, dual idea of how to change the world. And I started really um, becoming an activist, a political activist. And then I burnt out. You know, it was more that I was just fighting for peace. I wasn't really being peace. And I was really becoming part of the problem, I would say. This sort of anger had overtaken me and I was really uh, not a happy person. And so I know, being brought up in India, that spirituality and religion help you on the path of peace. So I went on a long search and I met first to Hindu teachers and I met many of very, very great teachers and then I went even, I didn't find, I found too much God or too much Guru actually. It wasn't quite, I'm, a, I'm skeptical by nature. And I think uh, the Buddha allowed that or encouraged that. Remember in the Kalama Sutra, he talks about, don't even believe me. Uh, practice what I, I say and see if it brings you joy, happiness, peace, uh, et, et, et cetera. So then I even practiced with Quakers and the Christian traditions, Sufi in the Muslim tradition, animist, tribal. I went all over the place for about eight years, seven, eight years. And then I started slowly meeting Buddhist teachers, first in the Burmese tradition, then in the Tibetan tradition. And I started finding that the Buddha's teachings really resonated with me. And I'd say there were four things that really resonated deeply, uh, which suited me. The first was the primacy of suffering. I think that we have to look at this world, this experience, as the sort of compost for our awakening, for uh, making the beautiful flower of joy, of peace. And so how to work with that? It wasn't about life hereafter or some sort of heaven where it is all beautiful. The, as Thich Nhat Hanh often says, the kingdom of heaven is here and now. We can transform this moment into this moment of uh, bliss, of awakening. The second part, which I think I really liked about the Buddha's teachings, was this teaching of Pratit Samutpada. What we often talk of as interdependent, uh, uh, dependent origination, what Thich Nhat Hanh very eloquently coined as interbeing. This understanding that everything has, is a cause and effect of everything else. Um, and this is linked also to the, the anatma theory, that there is no idea of a single individuated self that exists uh, outside of anything of, of contingent reality. 
this is very important because this was against what I've been brought up with in a Hindu tradition uh, of the idea of an Atma and therefore to also justify the caste system and many other uh, social uh, constructs. The third element of Buddhism, I think, which really uh, inspired me was that you can do the, that sort of self-reliance, self with the small s, that you can with the practice, with the teaching, uh, gain insight, transform and liberate. And also, of course, create calm and peace. And there are many sutras and teachings of the Buddha to do that. And the fourth element, which I feel was wonderful, was the teaching of mindfulness. That how we can, with developing that energy of present moment awareness, we can touch the beauty, the, uh, the, the, the miracle of the moment, the miracle of life. So here I went looking for Buddhist teachers. I then became a manager of a forming troupe got invited to California. And there uh, I started practicing with the Koreans, with the Japanese Zen. And then there was a retreat for artists in 1987 at the Ohio Foundation. And a, it was a gentle man, really. I mean, he was somebody who walked onto this, not even a stage, it was a tree. It was a, we, we used to call it the teaching tree. He just came and sat down very gently and started speaking. And I remember his gentleness, his demeanor, his presence, his words. They just hit me like arrows. But those arrows were made of very, very beautiful, soft flowers. And they offered freshness, they offered beauty. And they offered an authenticity of presence and love. And it just, you know, how you feel you sort of uh, fall in love in a sort of way. And, uh, and anyway, I was so open to this. I was looking for something which, which suited my uh, personality type. And I felt here was this man who was speaking that language from my own Indian tradition, but brought into a contemporary way. And on the second day, he taught us something called walking meditation. He gave us instructions and he said, use your presence, use your breath, count the number of steps you take with each breath, and then use a gutter, a short poem, to use with the in-breath and the out-breath. And I remember the gutter was something like, uh, my mind can go in a thousand directions on this beautiful path, I walk in peace. With each step, a gentle wind blows. And with each step, a flower blooms. So you can imagine your steps are coming down, touching the earth, gently kissing the earth, and you're imagining a flower blooming. You're all familiar with the story of the Buddha when he was born taking seven steps, and under each step, a lotus bloomed. Of course, it's a beautiful imagination of an artist, but that is the sort of aspiration, that is the sort of touch you give with your feet kissing the earth, this moment, this moment, this moment. And how Thich Nhat Hanh transformed this practice of walking into this great practice of um, present moment awareness. And we walk all the time and how to do that. And since then, that has been 30 years, I've tried to do exactly that. Of course, I forget. My mind goes off here and there. And I come back to my breath. I come back to my step. And I remind myself that this is a special moment. I have legs to walk. I have feet to walk. What a joy. What a miracle. And I'm reminded of a quote that uh, Thai shared, which was the quote of Lin Chi, the in a way, the, one of the founders of the lineage that I, we belong to, the Zen tradition uh, of the Linchi or the Rinzai in Japan uh, tradition. And Linchi said something like, people say the miracle is to walk on the air or to walk on water. But the real miracle is to walk on the earth. So uh, this is a miracle for all of us. We can do it. And I feel I really touched peace for the first time. 
I experienced it viscerally. And so there was my experience of really being peace in a way. And I found a way of being peace rather than just fighting and struggling for peace. And I was so fortunate to found a teacher, a guiding teacher on the spot, who combined peace activism and a contemplative tradition, bringing sort of Gandhi and Buddha, my two mentors, my two heroes at the time. And as he was leaving the journey, as he was leaving the retreat, I remember him saying something quite uh, sweetly, actually. Please uh, help bring the Buddha Dharma back to India. Please help bring the Buddha Dharma back to India. You know, I don't know if he remembers that at all, but it became a little bit of like a koan, like a, an aspiration. And I realized that this great teaching, which has disappeared from the land of India, will help us a lot to, on many, many fronts, not just the social and economic and political fronts, but also as a spiritual revival of people of India. And India will then share that with the world again, through education, through trade, through all sorts of different ways that we've done this for centuries before. And then Tiknathan asked me to organize a pilgrimage, as Dr. V was suggesting, uh, was saying, uh, to India, uh, to the Buddhist sites, uh, the next year. He finished writing a book, which I would recommend you to read, called Old Path, White Clouds. It's a story about the life of the Buddha. And then he basically pretty much took me by the arm through this pilgrimage of over a month and opened up the life of the Buddha as a human being. You know, I've been brought up very much to think of the Buddha as some sort of God. And in India, we think like that. But here he was a human being. And as we walked up Vulture Peak, I remember him holding my hand, pausing, looking out over the, over the hill and saying, not even say, just look. And in that, I could touch that what the Buddha had seen and what you know, I could just feel that sort of sense of non-dual uh, experience of, you know, being one with everything or being in a sort of relationship with everything else. And Thai gently said to me something like, you know, this is where uh, my Buddha eyes opened. And I feel that he was sort of giving me a transition, a uh, transmission like this. And then, of course, we watched the sunset. The Buddha loved watching the sunset from Vulture Peak. And again, Thai said something like, yes, the Buddha was here 2,600 years ago. But the Buddha saw the sunset in the present moment. And so we have the chance to open our Buddha eyes. And what the Buddha's teachings are, are an invitation to us to awaken, not just follow in the footsteps, but to learn how to do it. And so, this whole journey, which went with Thai and many of his monks and nuns that, at that time, taught me many things. Of course, we went to the main sites where the Buddha had been, you know, places like the Deer Park or the Jetta Grove, these are places where uh, Dr. V also goes uh, very often. But also we met the people. I remember meeting a young girl in the village where Sujata was, about the same age as Sujata. And we saying, here is a direct, uh, is a descendant of the people the Buddha met. And then the context, the mango groves, seeing somebody doing the plowing, sitting under the Bodhi tree. And I remember there was a poignant moment, which he also describes in his book, Old Path, White Clouds, where he talks about the Buddha looking up at the tree and seeing a leaf. This is in fact a leaf from the Bodhi tree and looking at the leaf and then asking, what do you see? What do you see in this leaf? And somebody might just say, a leaf. But actually, when you look deeply, you see the rain, the cloud, the sunshine, the earth, the ancestors of this tree, the bird who's, who planted the seed in a way through her alimentary canal. And slowly, slowly you start seeing the whole universe in this tree, in this leaf. 
And that's what the Buddha's great insight was. This great insight of interbeing, that everything is cause and conditions and nothing is separate from each other. And so the Buddha, is, the Thich Nhat Hanh is very simple and yet lucid way brings you right to that awakening of the Buddha. Just by picking up a leaf like this and saying, what do you see in this leaf? And of course it was very moving because the Buddha, you can see the Buddha looking at this leaf, this tree, and treating the tree as his ancestor, as his teacher. And so when I look at the tree now, I always think of the tree as my ancestral spiritual teacher. The Buddha was not separate from the tree. They were both co-communicating at the time. And then of course, it's not where you go, but how you go. You know, very much like a retreat on wheels. Waking up in the morning, doing our practice, doing walking meditation everywhere we go, you know, reading the sutras, having Dharma discussions. And so it's, I really think of it a bit like a retreat on wheels. And so going like this with Thai every time and going each time. And now I've been on the pilgrimage probably more than a hundred times. And um, every year the Tikkatan suggested, why don't you go? This is a practice the Buddha suggested in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra. It's a wonderful practice. Why don't you do this? And so I did. But I think what is important, of course, to always realize that, as I said earlier, we are going to meet somebody who was there 2,600 years ago, but the Buddha was always there, whatever he was doing, whether it was sitting or lying or walking in the present moment. And we have that opportunity to do the same. And that journey was also very historical for our community, for the community of Plum Village, where the nuns, Sister Chang Kong, Sister Annabelle were first ordained on Vulture Peak. And then Thich Nhat Hanh's come back to India a few times in 98, in 2008. Uh, I won't have time to share about that now, but another time maybe. And we set up a trust called Ahimsa Trust to do his work in India, to propagate his teachings. And I fortunately had an opportunity many times to travel with him through the world, whether it was in the US or in China, uh, to Vietnam, and also to the Malaysia trip that was mentioned by uh, Dr. Wee uh, in September 2010, I think it was. A wonderful uh, visit with where, and everywhere Thai teaches his, in his inimical style, uh, his ability to bring these profound teachings of the Buddha and make them accessible through a simplicity and also make them understandable to us and how to share the practice is phenomenal. How he does this so easily and some of the most complex teachings, such as the teaching on emptiness, for example, and teaching it through the sleep. He often does it with a piece of paper. Some of you may have seen that. You know, what do you see in this piece of paper? You see everything from the grandmother, the logger in that paper. And then the Buddha, uh, and then Thai also bring, makes everything into a practice. The bowing. You know, when you bow, I see in you a Buddha to be, that awakened person, the potentiality. Uh, when you drink tea, you just drink tea. And then he secularized so much of the practice which is brought out of the monastery in terms of relationships. There's a practice called beginning anew, with children, uh, telephone meditation, driving meditation, hugging meditation. We have time for questions. We'll, if you have any questions on that sort of uh, score, I might share a little bit on that if you're interested. <clears throat> but I think, uh, in fact, he was very kind even to officiate at my wedding. Uh, I remember on the first journey in 1988, uh, my, he, he, he and Chiang Kong shaved my hair. I think at that time, there was some aspiration of being a monk, but it grew back again, I got married, and Thich Nhat Hanh created this wonderful ceremony, uh, and in it was the five awarenesses, which he then asked us to recite on every full moon. So my wife and I have been doing that now for the last 20, nearly 25 years now. So it's amazing how he's been able to contemporize uh, and also make accessible the great and profound teachings of the Buddha. And as was mentioned in the beginning, mindfulness has now become a very popular type of uh, practice, 
mainly because of the scientific authentication of it. But Thich Nhat Hanh is really the person who's known as the father of mindfulness, at least in the West. Uh, he published that famous book, The Miracle of Mindfulness in 1975. And mindfulness is, is sort of kind of energy that we generate. You know, it's a sort of, uh, it's generate when we meditate, when we bring our mind back and to the present moment, the mind and body back into the present moment. And it's a sort of a present moment, non-judgmental awareness. And that generation of mindfulness brings a great joy because everything you see, everything you touch, allows you to touch that, to touch that, uh, that experience as a miracle. And also mindfulness helps you develop concentration. Concentration is an important part of the practice. When you develop concentration, you can then penetrate more deeply into any experience, whether it's an external experience, seeing something more deeply like we saw in the leaf, or it could be an internal experience, like an emotion. It could be your anger, looking at more deeply. So mindfulness brings us back to the present moment, allows us that energy to be present, and then concentration, which comes automatically with mindfulness, allows us to penetrate whatever we are trying to look more at more deeply. And out of that comes the insight, the wisdom. And um, we know this, we've known this for 2,600 years. But in the last few years, because of the scientific uh, support, especially to neuroplasticity and epigenetics, etc., you know, there's been a huge mushrooming of the mindfulness movement. Uh, and, you know, in, for meditators, uh, like many of us, we are it's an inner subjective experience. But for science, uh, they look at the external world and rely on third person investigation. That is very good for bringing this to schools, bringing this to the corporate world. And this is what we've been doing because we realize that it is helpful for stress reduction, it's helpful for impulse control, for boosting creativity, for reducing chronic pain, uh, reducing depression, all sorts of aspects of it, uh, improving relationships. But for us, uh, it is also the doorway to awakening. And I think that is why the Buddha was suggesting it, to bring mental calm, to bring peace, to bring joy, and of course, awakening. And that is the path of awakening that the Buddha was offering us. Now the question is, how do you practice? And that has always uh, been, you know, we can all know the theory, but that's why when the Buddha suggested and laid out in his sutras, like the Anapanasati Sutra or the Satipatthana Sutra, the Satipatthana Sutra is the sutra on the four foundations of mindfulness. The Anapanasati Sutra is the sutra on the full awareness of breathing, the 16 methods of breathing, and also the Bhattakarata Sutra, how to live happily in the present moment. And the Buddha has offered us in a very, um, how do you say, uh, uh, delineated way how to do this. In fact, in the Anapanasati Sutra, he talks there are four sets of what we call tetras, and the first is on the body, the breath and the body, and the second is on the feelings. So in fact, the fifth and sixth exercises are how to bring joy and how to bring happiness. And the seventh and eighth exercises are how to handle strong emotions. And then, of course, he goes into the mental formations, and then he goes into uh, and then he goes into consciousness. So, like the Satipatthana Sutra is the same, you know, the body, the feelings, the mind, and the objects of mind. And we always start with the body, and here we start with the breath. You know, we breathe eighteen thousand to twenty-four thousand times a day. But how many of us are really aware of even one of those breaths? And it requires the practice. It requires the, uh, the remembrance. And that is the, what mindfulness means, the remembrance of coming back. And that's why when I invite the bell, which I'm going to do again, let the sound penetrate into your consciousness and think of the bell as the voice of the Buddha bringing you back to your true home, which is the present moment. So let's try.
So friends, for me, the bell is a great gift. I am so grateful to Thich Nhat Hanh, to the Buddha, to all our ancestral teachers, for these tools they've given us to come back to the present. And we can create our own bells of mindfulness. It doesn't always have to be the sound of a bell. It can be the face of your child. It can be um, the telephone bell. It can be the doorbell. It can be a doorknob. You create your own bells of mindfulness. Something that reminds you to come back into the present moment and think of it like the voice of the Buddha bringing you back to your true home, to this present moment. It's great. It's great because we have those tools to bring joy and happiness and peace into every moment, even in the midst of suffering, even in the midst of despair. We have to be able to touch those conditions of happiness that we have. And then we can look after the suffering. Otherwise, if you are a mess, you can't bring happiness to yourself or to others, then it's not so good. But we have those tools and that's what the Buddha was offering us. And through conscious breathing, amazing, something that we all have, it's a universe. So we all have that ability. It's not some uh, ability of some great uh, caste or great, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, privileged group. It's really all of us. And when we realize that we can come back to the present moment and really touch the beauty and the conditions of happiness here, we know that the future will be better. Because there's only one substance that the future is made of. And that is the present moment. The present makes up the future. And how you are in the present makes up the future. And I remember Thai saying something, something like this, that by taking care of the present, you're, taking, you're doing everything you can to assure a good future. And, you know, he's interesting. He teaches practices like smiling. You know, smiling, you wouldn't think is a great Zen practice, you know, where you often have this idea of the very serious. But the smile, when you are able to touch the miracle of this life, the smile appears. The smile in your heart, the smile in your lips, the smile inside your mouth, the smile in your eyes. And of course, our great scientific friends have said that it has a very strong neurological effect. It um, relaxes the muscles in the mouth, in the face. But also, <clears throat> uh, when you smile, it releases certain hormones, uh, including dopamine and serotonin. And uh, dopamine is, of course, uh, that happiness uh, hormone. And serotonin releases, uh, it, it reduces stress. And so just this very act of smiling, which uh, <clears throat> is, is a great type of a, it's a practice. Um, and, you know, if you don't feel like smiling, you think, yeah, I'm you know, nothing good to do in this life. But this yoga of smiling, you still feel better. So the, so the Thich Nhat Hanh often talks about stopping, breathing, and smiling. And when the telephone bell rings, he says, oh, use the telephone bell like your mindfulness bell. Just let the telephone, the first ring, never pick up your telephone for at least three rings. The first, stop. Stop what you're doing. Stop what you're thinking. Come back to the present moment. Second, breathing. So using the breath to come back to the present. And third, the smile. And then you can say, hello, Bobby Ann. Hello, Alex. Hello, Dr. V. You know, hello, your, your beloved or your child or your boss or your friend. The presence is greater, the communication is better, and you hear deeper. It's not hello with the irritation. So you transform this practice of stopping, breathing, smiling into the telephone. And of course, when the Buddha talked about his, in the Anapanasati Sutra, the Satipatthana Sutra, he talked about the body, being aware of the body. And, you know, recognizing the body, calming the body, relaxing the body, recognizing different positions, different actions, uh, mindful movements, and observing different parts of the body, right from the head to the toes, to make deeper contact with the body, and really appreciating the body. 
appreciating the different parts of the body when, you know, which we have had, like the heart's been beating since we were, before we were born. Saying, hello heart, how are you? Smiling to the heart, giving it a sense of uh, appreciation. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh has this wonderful uh, thing where he says, celebrate your non-toothache. When you have a toothache, you know, you think, oh God, I, I can't stand it. This toothache is driving me mad. But now, I hope none of you have a toothache. So celebrate the non-toothache. In fact, we might, in a few minutes, uh, have a little share meditation maybe on, on the body, just uh, in a few minutes. So. But let me just transition through from the body to feelings. And, you know, again, as you're saying, the, we have these different types of feelings, the neutral feelings, the uh, pleasant feelings, the unpleasant feelings. But it's always important to remember that we, feelings arise because of a certain contact that is made. It's automatic. But our problem is we react to that feeling too fast. So a great practice of the Buddha is non-reactivity. But how do we create that? We, create, we have to create a space between the time our feeling arises and the time we react. And there again, we use the breath. Now, it's very hard to remember that a feeling actually is there only for 90 seconds to 120 seconds, according to neuroscientists. At that point, it's like, Oh, you really get angry or you feel that sense of fear or whatever the negative emotion is or sometimes a positive emotion. But the Buddha was very clear in his teachings. He said, everything that arises will pass away and so do, so do feelings, so do thoughts. Sometimes I give this feeling, I get this, uh, give this, I do this practice of sitting, like sitting on a bank and looking at my feelings like a river and identifying the feelings. And this uh, is a practice that was offered actually by Vasubandhu uh, in the fifth century. Uh, he was a great Nalanda master. And he talked about how do we look at our mind uh, and our mental formations. And our tradition, uh, the Tiknathan's tradition, the Tipian tradition of Plum Village, is very much part of that. It's, it's a school of Buddhist uh, psychology. And here we talk about different types of seeds and feelings are one of those seeds which lie in our store consciousness, in the alaya. And we, we, by our contact, our sensorial contact with our six senses, we touch that. And that uh, diet of sensorial diet then touches a particular seed in our store consciousness and that arises. So you might see something or hear something which causes a uh, a sense of compassion to arise. On the other hand, you might see something or hear something or smell something uh, which touches the, 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 the seed of, of fear or anger. And so this whole practice uh, is of what we call selective watering, touch, allowing those seeds to be touched which are more wholesome, more, uh, more pleasant, and then looking at those seeds. Uh, in, a, in a deeper way. But for all that, the one energy you need to cultivate all the time is mindfulness. And that is also one of the seeds. So in our school, we talk about 51 types of mental formations. And when a particular seed arises, is touched, it comes into, from the store, it comes into the living room, as it were, from the basement to the living room, if you can see that analogy. And to our mind consciousness and uh, from the store consciousness and it overtakes us. So the practice is then to first recognize, as I was saying, look at it and say, oh, hello, my old friend, anger. Here you are again. Can you recognize it? Do we have the ability to recognize it? And then to accept it. We have to always start to accept it. We can't say, oh, I don't like it. Accept. And then to embrace it, Thay, Thich Nhat Hanh gives a wonderful example of, he says, when a mother hears her child crying in the next room, she'll put down whatever she's doing, she'll go and pick up the crying child and hold the child, and the child will stop crying. And that is what is called embracing. You embrace your emotion, whether it's your anger or your fear, like a mother embraces a child. 
And what happens? Not only does the child stop crying, but then the mother knows why the child is crying. Is, it, is the nappy too tight? Is the baby hungry? Does it need to burp? And that is what you investigate into that emotion, into that mental formation, into that state. And when you do, you get an insight. Oh, this is a habit energy I have. Every time uh, that person comes into my view, I think of that person, I suddenly feel more angry. I feel, or I suddenly feel more loving. Uh, oh, why did I really like that person? Maybe she reminded me of the hairstyle was my mother's hairstyle. It could be anything, just a, some sort of insight. And also realizing that everything changes, everything's interconnected. And that allows for a transformation, that transformation that the Buddha offered us, that ability to live this life in an awakened way, in everything we do. And so I think it's important that we also try and keep images in our mind that can bring us happiness. You know, I have an image of my two daughters sitting on a bed as children. It's a joyful image for me. And so sometimes, you know, if I get something which I feel is not, I just need to change the, the CD as it were, I can slot in a good image. So always remember to have tools on your side, but the best tools, of course, are the breath, body, the mind, the watering of seeds, and then slowly cultivating this aspect of mindfulness, peace, and joy in everything you do. And again, I just feel it's not just in the Theravada tradition of Anapanasati or Satipatthan, Thiknathan has, uh, we have lineage from the Mahayan, we are mainly a Mahayan community. So of course we use the Heart Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, the Avatam Saka Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, we have also lineage from Bajrayan. So I think it's, we, I just think of all this as Buddhayana, it's not just one or the other. We have these teachings in every school. And so let us enjoy the gift that has been given to us by our great common teacher, the Buddha, and also contemporize for people like me through my teaching uh, or my teacher, uh, the Venerable Thich um, He has been a master Sangha builder. Uh, this has been a great gift of his. And in his insight, he often talks about the Buddha to be, the Buddha to be a Sangha, a community of monks, nuns, laymen, laywomen, and I would like to add children. This fourfold community. And what it means is that we are not just to awaken individually, but we are to awaken collectively. And it is clear that your happiness is my happiness, your suffering is my suffering. There's no discrimination, separation between other and I. That is the basis of our suffering. This idea of me, mine, and I. And so this insight that Thai had of the Sangha being the next Buddha, the collective mind, is something that he's been really cultivating in all of us who are his children, his students. And it's manifested so beautifully in places like Plum Village which is uh, Dr. V talked about in the beginning, a center in France. But there are many plum villages. There's one in, you know, <clears throat> Hong Kong. There's one in, there's in Germany, in the US, in Australia, uh, and in Vietnam, uh, and in India. We are setting up a plum village here. So there's a sort of, but a plum village is a type of state of mind, a collective. And we have now hundreds of thousands of people all around the world who've been touched by Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings. And I feel that each of these small little groups which meet for meditation once a week, or once a month, are part of that Plum Village movement. And I think it is really bringing Buddha in a contemporary way to our civilization, our collective civilization as human beings. And I think it's renewing Buddhism also in the countries that have been traditionally Buddhist, as many of you have come together. And I know also in Malaysia, there's a joyfully together Sangha uh, there. So, <clears throat> I'm just... So I will pause now and I will uh, invite the bell 
And with the bell, I will, for the next maybe 10 minutes, lead a guided meditation. wonderful Chinese tea from across the Himalayas. Brothers in the Dhamma, brothers in enjoying our tea. So <clears throat> this guided meditation for about 10 minutes will be based around the breath and the body. We'll do a body scan and awareness of the breath. So I will invite the bell and I'll give instructions as we go along. So please sit in a comfortable way. You can adjust your posture if you want. If you're sitting on a cushion, sitting on a chair, on a sofa, try and sit in a way which is stable, comfortable, and try to keep your spine upright. That offers you an alertness. Let your shoulders be relaxed. your head and neck sitting gently on your shoulders, feeling an invisible string holding your head up to the sky. And your hands in your lap, on your knees. And just feeling that sense of stability and solidity as you bring your attention to your breath. Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in. And breathing out, I know I'm breathing out. In, out. Find it more easy, you can close your eyes. Just feel breath. And feel the whole length of the breath from the beginning of the in breath to the end of the in breath, from the beginning of the out breath to the end of the out breath. And you might notice the quality of breathing changing a little bit. You can feel your breath in your abdomen, the gentle rise and fall of the abdomen. If you find it easy, you can put your hand in your abdomen and just feel the rise and fall of each breath. And you might notice that your breath is getting deeper, going slower. <coughs> so 
So just being aware of the miraculous nature of each breath. And then bring that awareness of the breath to the whole body. <clears throat> Where my whole body, I breathe in. Relaxing my body, I breathe out. Calming my body, feeling at ease in my body. and enjoying the stillness in my body. And being attentive to the miraculous nature of the body. And now we bring the attention to different parts of the body. And when we bring our attention to that part of the body, we can smile that smile of awareness, that smile of awakening, of gratitude, of appreciation to that part of the body. Where my eyes, I breathe in. Smiling to my eyes, I breathe out. My eyes that help me see the beauty of nature, the face of my children, the trees, my beloved, colors, forms, thank you eyes. And breathing in, I'm aware of my ears. Breathing out, I smile to my ears. Ears smiling. Ears that help me hear singing, hear the voice of children, of laughter, the sound of rain. the song of birds. And the ears that help me hear the sound of silence. Thank you, ears. And breathing in, I'm aware of my teeth. Breathing out, I smile to my teeth. Teeth that can help me bite and chew my food. Thank you, teeth. Breathing in, I'm aware of my tongue. Breathing out, I smile to my tongue. Tongue that helps me taste wonderful food, that helps me speak. Thank you, tongue. Breathing in, I'm aware of my nose. Breathing out, I smile to my nose. Thank you, nose. It helps me smell the fragrance of flowers, the fresh grass. of the new rain on dry ground. Breathing in, I'm aware of my arms. Breathing out, I'm aware of my arms and hands, arms that allow me to reach out, to hug my friends, my beloved, my children. To hold a pen, to invite the bell, 
Thank you, arms and hands. Breathing in, I'm aware of my heart. Breathing out, I smile to my heart. A heart that's been beating, pumping blood through my body. Keep my body at a constant temperature. Thank you, heart. Breathing in, I'm aware of my legs and feet. Breathing out, I smile to my legs and feet. My legs and feet that help me to get places. To walk. Thank you, legs and feet. And breathing in, I'm aware of my whole body. Breathing out, I smile to my whole body. My whole body smiling. And as I invite the sound of the bell, I'll invite two sounds of the bell to close this short meditation, this guided meditation. Again, just feel the gratitude of being able to hear, to be able to listen, to have the breath of life, the joy of life, the peacefulness that is cultivated through our practice of mindfulness, the art of mindfulness. So thank you, dear friends, for sharing the practice with me. And uh, it's a wonderful practice we can see, not just for ourselves, but for children. We do a lot of work with children and bringing mindfulness to school education uh, with teachers and with children. And these are the practices that children find very easy. With young children, sometimes we put a boat on their stomach, let them lie down and let the boat, let the paper boat, and then let it rise up and down with their, with their belly. They love it. So. I will pause now and invite Dr. Wee uh, or, or anybody who would be asking questions at the time, the next 15-20 uh, minutes for questions and answers. Uh, if you have questions, I'd be very happy to take them. And uh, I do hope that you've enjoyed this, uh, this practice. And please do take at least one of those bells of mindfulness into your daily life, uh, whether it's the telephone bell, the doorbell, anything. To create a bell of mindfulness that helps you come back to the present moment using the breath and touching the miracle, the joy and the peace in yourself. Thank you. Please, uh, questions are welcome. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Shantan Zi, for giving us such an inspiring talk. And um, maybe in order to start off, uh, let me see, is there a question coming in? Okay, there is a question. This comes from Brother David T. And he says that the majority of people in the world are peace-loving and law-abiding people. Some are very religious and spiritual. And... Uh, let me see. Uh, but the problem is uh, we find that powerful world leaders are promoting hatred, evil, violence, discrimination, racism, uh, which are not good for this world. What can ordinary people under such circumstances do uh, besides our personal cultivation? Yeah, thank you, David. It's, I think it's a question which um, um, is an important question because uh, as I mentioned earlier, we all have the seeds within us of violence, greed, hatred, anger, 
fear, but you also have the seeds of love, of peace, of joy, of togetherness, of happiness, of forgiveness. And it's what seeds we want to water. And in the fields of politics, and in the fields of sometimes of a sort of cutthroat uh, type of competitive business, sometimes the seeds, which are the unwholesome seeds, get more and more watered. Now, <clears throat> that is our duty in a way, uh, as teachers, as anybody in the media, whatever we do, is to try and help water the seeds of uh, peace and joy. And to know that the other seeds also exist. None of us are uh, immune to it. The Buddha, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, all the great teachers we've had, they've all had these seeds arise in their, in their consciousness, and, but they've known how to handle them. So the thing is to also create understanding, to know why this is happening, so it doesn't water that seed of anger in ourselves. I remember once there was a, a terrorist, a so-called, and from his point of view, a freedom fighter. He, was, um, in, he came into a hotel in Bombay and started using a gun and killing people there. Uh, and it brought up a lot of anger in me because it was going on for two days. It was the Taj Hotel. And I felt, God, how, you know, it just broke. And I went for a walk and I tried to look at that anger. And I saw some flowers and I luckily I smiled at the flowers. The flowers were still smiling. I felt, okay, I'm still sane. And then I sat down and I contemplated and I thought, who is this man? And without knowing who he was, I realized this man has probably been indoctrinated. He's probably coming from a relatively poor family. He's been given some incentive, some indoctrination, and he feels he's doing good by doing this. Now, and what came out was compassion and my anger shifted to compassion. It wasn't that I was saying what he's doing is right. But then my way of re responding was that I was not also not getting ill by his action. And then if I had a particular type of a, a role to play, I would hopefully respond in a compassionate way rather than in an aggressive and a con conflict laden way, which would then exacerbate it later. So I think the Buddha had the same situation in his time. There were kings who were fighting each other, who were angry, somebody trying to kill his son, uh, a son trying to kill a father, wars, but he was counseling them to try and bring peace. So yes, we will have uh, greed, hatred, anger, ignorance in our world, but we must try and cultivate a sense of uh, non-discrimination. And I think that is the key of the Buddha's teaching, how to understand that there is no such thing as an I, we are all interconnected, all interdependent. So I don't know whether we can do that, but we should start as young children uh, and with schools too. And I think the Buddhist Gem Fellowship is also trying to do that as Ahimsa Trust is. So it's a global movement of people trying to cultivate a, a more conscious society. And out of that will come the future politicians. Um, Shantanji, just another question. Uh, this is from uh, Wee Hai Aang. Uh, the question is that how can a scientific approach towards living the Dharma helps us to lead a balanced uh, life, which is worldly and spiritual in a very fruitful manner? Is it okay uh, for us to question our faith in the Dharma using the scientific approach as mentioned by the Buddha in the Kalama Sutta? Yes, uh, it's um, again a good question because uh, today the new religion in a way is science. Uh, so we have to be aware that uh, we have to balance our, uh, our faith or our uh, understanding of our spiritual or tradition uh, practice with, our, with, with that. Uh, so I think, yes, it is important that we, we balance science with spirituality. And fortunately for us who are interested in Buddhism, this is very much the Buddha's own injunction, as you said in the Kalama Sutra and, and other sutras too. So I think it's very important that we do. And modern science has helped us to really realize that uh, many of the mind training techniques that the Buddha taught us have huge validity. And if you find that something is not in sync with um, the, the uh, modern science, question it and see whether it's really uh, of value. And I think science and spirituality have to go together today. And it is a very valid thing. So also question science. There's a lot of fake science too. We have to look at science as it's developing. So try and balance the two in your life. And you know, um, I sometimes liken 
this uh, to living with two legs, two, two feet. One foot is in the scientific world and one in the spiritual world. And it's like living in the historical realm and the ultimate dimension. But they're not separate. They're actually interconnected. So I feel the marriage of science and spirituality is of our time, or it's uh, in the 21st century, we are of that, of that, uh, uh, of, of that um, collective consciousness, of, and we must bring the two together. Don't reject one for the other. But yes, I think uh, we should try it. Uh, and as the Buddha said, you know, if you have to take the gold, you, you beat it, you burn it, you test it for its eye, that is really gold. Um, and uh, the goldsmiths are the same with the, with the Dhamma. If there's something we find that is not suiting our sense of um, the, the, the reality of impermanence, of interconnectedness, of the primacy of suffering and the ability to transform, uh, then yeah, we should, we should question it and discuss with our Sangha, with our teachers, with our friends, and see whether we can really bring a, a type of balance in our lives through that. Yes, thank you. So, Dr. Wee, we are. Uh, we, we, you want? Uh, did you want to share something? You're, you're muted right now. I think we will invite a sound of the bell. Come back to our breathing as Dr. Wee is on his telephone. I don't know if there's another question. Um, I don't see, I wonder whether you can hear me. Am I, have I gone off the thing or is? We, we can hear you. Oh, you can. Okay, good, good. Okay. Uh, so, so I was just waiting for Dr. B to ask a question. Otherwise, I will, uh, you know, what I was... I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't tell. <laughs> ah, okay. No, no, no problem. Uh, because I was, I was on the mute and I could not unmute myself. A lot of question from Aitan, <laughs> which is there are so many killings whereby innocent people are victims. For example, the US, uh, US bombing of Saigon. How does one forget these times and forgive those who did uh, that, uh, these are indeed uh, penetrating and very hurtful. Yes, uh, no, I think that is uh, true. Um, that is how um, the history of our humankind has been on this earth. Um, and it's a similar sort of response to what I said earlier. We, we have to find space in our heart to know that people are acting out of ignorance that they have not had the opportunity to touch good uh, teachers, teachings uh, in their life to bring joy, happiness, and compassion. Uh, they are suffering greatly if they can create that sort of suffering for others. And so let that, those seeds of compassion and forgiveness arise. And as I said, don't uh, condone what, what they're doing by killing people or creating uh, this sort of great suffering, like the bombing of Saigon, etc., which are a real blot. But we must learn from that. We must learn from our history that we cannot have that again. And we are reminded, you know, a few days ago was Hiroshima Day or Nagasaki Day. Uh, completely uh, absurdity of human uh, intellect, 
uh, civilizational um, development, you know, terrorist act. Uh, but it created a horror in the minds of human beings that we should never have another Hiroshima and another Nagasaki. And now it's been more than 50, 60 years, and hopefully that consciousness has shifted, and we do not have that. And this, we have to look at those situations and make some sort of shift in consciousness. You've seen smoking. When I was a young man, we would smoke. It was a very common thing. I used to smoke. Now we hardly find people smoking. So we have to see that we can shift as a collective consciousness. And those things, the children of the people who bomb Saigon are maybe the ones who will not do that if they can find love and uh, forgiveness in their heart and meet the brotherhood and sisterhood, not to see the people of Vietnam or the people of China or the people of India or the people of Argentina as something like the other. We are one human family. And I think the Buddha's teachings were very founded on being humanistic, on finding our interconnectedness and not just as human family, but as a family with, uh, through nature, through the clouds. When Thich Nhat Hanh talks about drinking his tea, he says, can you see the cloud in the tea? Drink your cloud. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, um, we have a very wonderful talk given by Shantam Ji this morning. Uh, this is actually sharing. He was telling us about how his encounter, he, there was a search uh, for uh, trying to find a teacher. He's tried so many things after meeting with an accident, and then he, he came across the um, uh, Venerable Chitya Han. And the uh, book that he mentioned, which is The Miracle of Mindfulness, was the, the very first book that I read, written by Chitya Han, that also impressed me so much. It was, I was almost uh, put into a spell when I read the book, and suddenly you begin to realize how wonderful being in the present moment can be. And um, Shantam also told us about how he was uh, arranging the pilgrimage with Venerable Tuya Han. And in fact, it was a real privilege to be able to be so close to a teacher, like even taking up a leaf and seeing the interbeing within the leaf, how uh, the leaf doesn't appear by itself, but it is there because of so many factors. And you can see the cloud, the rain, and the ancestors of the trees, even the earth, or in the leaf and how everything becomes connected. And even the act of even drinking tea itself can be so meaningful. So um, we also had uh, the opportunity to do uh, some meditation together with, with uh, led by Shanto. And uh, in fact, today, in fact, had been a, a wonderful talk. Uh, and we'd like to thank uh, Shanto for being with us this morning, for sharing the Dharma with us. And uh, is, he himself is doing very good work in India, uh, bringing the message of the, the Buddhist message uh, to India. So thank you so much, uh, Shantung. We hope to see you again, maybe at some other stage, uh, some, some other time when it is possible, then we can uh, arrange for another talk uh, with you, right? And I hope uh, people this morning have also benefited very much from the talk. Uh, um, we, um, uh, it is nice to be able to uh, listen to a disciple of such a great teacher and to be able to share with us, you know, his interactions and what he learns from the teacher. Uh, uh, we have the, of course, the privilege of listening to Ajahn Brahm, for instance, all this talks about his teacher, Ajahn Chah. And here we have the kids of Shantum talking about Tuya Han. All right, so we have actually come to the end of our Dhamma talk. Uh, let us uh, recall all the meritorious actions that we have done. Uh, we have gathered together this morning uh, to listen to our Dharma talk, we feel very inspired uh, in, the, in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. We have renewed our faith and refuge in the Triple Gem and learned how to abandon wrong views and practices and develop uh, to develop wisdom and compassion in our lives. Uh, by the power of this merit that we have accumulated today, as well as in the past, may we and our loved ones be free from harm and danger. May our problems be overcome, our difficulties be overcome. May we always be blessed with good health. Uh, may our homes and property be protected. Uh, may we dedicate our merits for the elevation of suffering of other living beings. 
and let us also strive on in our cultivation so that we can bring benefit and happiness to the world and let us make good progress along the path of Dhamma so that one day we might be able to experience the highest place of Nirvana. Sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Dr. B. Uh, if I may just invite three sounds the bell to close and one half sound when we bow out. And thank you for dedicating the merit of uh, all this we sharing together as a Sangha, as a community. And of course, I would offer again my great gratitude to my teacher, the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, who is not keeping so well now in Vietnam and may this, uh, this merit transfer to his uh, well-being too, as also the well-being of many others who are suffering today, right now in this world. So I'll invite three sounds of the bell just to close and one half sound just to bow out. Would that be okay, Dr. B? Yes, that would be excellent, Shanto. Thank you. <laughs>